the Korean War ravaged the streets of South Korea in the 1950s. There had been no economic growth since Korean independence in 1945, and war expenses had left millions of the Korean people financially devastated. The previous two political systems had been incompetent, ineffective, and corrupt. But just half a century later, South Korea's economy has flourished and now includes multi-billion dollar companies such as Samsung and Hyundai. But how did the poorest of the 120 countries in the United Nations, with a GDP per capita of just $72, become a country with one of the strongest economies in the world today? This miraculous economic recovery was the work of one man's leadership that left a hugely controversial legacy, the ruthless South Korean dictator, Park Chung-hee. Park Chung-hee was born on November 14, 1917, in Gumi, Korea into a poor family at the time, when Korea was under Japanese rule. He joined the Japanese army in 1933 and was selected for a two-year training program at the Tokyo Military Academy, graduating at the top of his class. When the Republic of Korea was born, Park rose rapidly in the military hierarchy and eventually became one of the most powerful and influential figures in the military. By 1961, Park had organized a military coup d'etat that overthrew the brief period of democratic rule and galvanized nearly three decades of military rule. In 1963, he legally won the democratic presidential election and became South Korea's fifth president. When Park Chung-hee took over South Korea in 1961, its political stability was among the world's weakest and it faced a formidable opponent to its north, with greater natural resources, superior industrial power, and the backing of Mao Zedong's unified and determined China. Park would have to find a way to make his nation both stronger and more stable. His foreign, domestic, and economic policies would all be key for the success of South Korea. With all the cards stacked against him, it seemed as if Park was fighting an uphill battle. The sentiment was clear with the international community, which was skeptical of Park's leadership ability. Douglas MacArthur, the head of the United Nations Special Delegation, was overheard saying, quote, This country has no future. This country will not be restored even after a hundred years. Vangalil Manon of the Special Delegation corroborated, saying, quote, A rose simply cannot blossom from a garbage dump. This in mind, it was clear that most were betting against Park's success and anticipating his downfall. Park was determined to prove them wrong. Park moved quickly to integrate South Korea with international sources of funding. In 1965, he normalized relations with Japan by signing the Treaty on Basic Relations to the chagrin of many South Koreans. The treaty opened the door for millions of dollars of investment from Japan and the United States, and created a Japanese market for cheap South Korean goods. Park also sent hundreds of thousands of soldiers to fight alongside the Americans in Vietnam which in return for troop commitments, South Korea received tens of billion dollars in grants, loans, subsidies, technological transfers, and preferential markets, all provided by the United States government. By 1967, South Korea's economic growth rate was at 7.8% per year, an incredibly high amount. Much of this money went into infrastructure. Earlier projects included industry-friendly projects like a highway to connect Seoul to the ports in Busan. Later projects raised the standard of living in rural areas, which had seen fewer of the benefits than the urban areas, through projects like the popular Sema Undong or New Village Movement. Park's government also transformed the South Korean economy into an export-oriented dynamo by heavily influencing the direction of some familiar companies, Hyundai, Samsung, and Daewoo. Soon, with all of Park's policies taking effect, the economy started to skyrocket. The GDP per capita rose from just $72 in 1961 to $1,857 in 1979. However, the key byproduct of Park's incredulous financial growth was the sacrifice of a democratic future. It was Park himself who declared during his rule that, quote, those who advocate democracy may hurl abuses at my body after death. Numerous military coups and documented human rights abuses exemplified Park's relentless pursuit of industrialization at the expense of democracy. 
Park also had little patience for dissidents, jailing, torturing, and even executing those who got in his way. Spies were everywhere. Anyone disagreed was a communist. Emerging democratic forces in the Park era exacerbated the pressure to his policies and voiced discontent. To maintain the stability of his programs, Park chose the repressive political line and shut off all potential opposition by introducing fundamental changes. In 1971, on the pretext of securing the state from democratic demonstrations, the president declared a state of martial law, dissolved the National Assembly, closed all of the university which was used as a basis for demonstrations, and, in October of 1972, issued a decree of what became known as the Yushin Constitution. This constitution was intended to strengthen the dictatorship of Park Chung-hee and made it virtually impossible for anyone to speak out against the governing body. I think, you know, Park Chung-hee will always be a controversial figure in Korea because he created what turned out to be a authoritarian regime that engaged in lots of practices that were objected to at the time violations of human rights, suppression of democracy. I think that Park is also rightfully credited with being really a transformational leader because he really took South Korea from being, as it emerged out of the Korean War, coping with the destruction of the Korean War, uh, but more importantly, he took it from being a largely poor agrarian country to becoming a modern industrial nation. It may well be that he suppressed democracy, but it may well be also that he created, ironically, the foundations for Korea as a modern democracy because of the economic development that took place. Although the growth of the South Korean economy had secured a high level of support for Park's presidency in the 1960s, that support began to fade after economic growth started slowing down in the early 1970s. Many South Koreans were becoming unhappy with his autocratic rule, his security services, and the restrictions placed on personal freedoms. As Park had legitimized his administration using the provisions laid down in the state of emergency laws dating all the way back to the Korean War, he had failed to address the constitutional guarantees of freedom of speech and of the press. Furthermore, his security service, the KCIA, retained broad powers of arrest and detention. Many of Park's opponents were held without trial and frequently tortured. Eventually, political demonstrations against the Yushin system erupted throughout the country as Park's level of unpopularity began to rise. After surviving several assassination attempts, including two operations associated with North Korea, Park was eventually assassinated on October 26, 1979 by Kim Jae-gyu, the chief of his own security services. He had led South Korea for 18 years before his death. After his assassination, the entire country mourned. Though in the later years of his leadership, his policies fueled discontent and even at times anger, Park's accomplishments and aid to the people of Korea greatly outweighed his shortcomings to the Korean population at the time. Hundreds of thousands were in tears after his passing. Even millions were saddened by his loss. <laughs> 신적이고 그러니까 히어로로 막 엄청한 것 같아요. 그래서 그 당시 이제 서구가 일어났을 때 우리 어머니도 우시고 그러니까 거리에서 막 사람들이 전부 막 큰일 났다. 응? Park Chung-hee's leadership ability, however controversially his legacy is analyzed, is undisputable. In a time of great crisis, a confident leader emerged with a plan of action, with the vision of an economically stable country in mind. Park set forth on the road to fighting what was seemingly a losing battle. He dedicated himself to the modernization of South Korea with foresight, had the ability to understand the trends of his time, and had an outstanding knowledge of economy and economic principles. Not 50 years ago, South Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. Yet today, Korea is a global superpower that ranks among the world's wealthiest nations. Today's image of South Korea is the legacy, the imprint that Park Chung-hee himself left on our world.